Hello again, and welcome to the continuation of our discussion on using a simple thought process to avoid common chess mistakes and also to find the best moves. In our last episode, I presented what I consider to be the best thought process to avoid playing tactically unsound moves. In this episode, we will be using the checks, captures, and threats method to locate a winning move. To further connect these two episodes, we will be examining the same position that we looked at in part one, and as promised, I will reveal the game from which I harvested our feature position. So without further delay, I present to you part two of our examination of the checks, captures, and threats thought process. We join the 1925 game between Hermanus Karlovich Madison and Vladimir Vukovic on move 20, where it is Black's turn. Last week, we used the checks, captures, and threats method to determine that our candidate move of queen captures e2 was a mistake. To recap, after queen takes e2, white can play rook takes f8 check. King takes f8, rook f1, check, king g8, queen f7, check, king h8, queen f8, check, rook takes f8, and rook takes f8, check, mate. We definitely don't want to play queen takes e2. So this week, we will turn our attention to using the same thought process to locate a better candidate move. Using the checks, captures, and threats method, we must first analyze all of our checks. First, we have two checks to analyze, but one is a check capture, so we'll start there. After rook takes f1 check, white can also play rook takes f1. Then queen takes e2, looks like a tempting candidate move, but isn't a check and fails quickly after white plays queen f7, check. Again, we see that being too eager to capture this bishop on e2 results in losing the game. So after rook takes f1 and rook takes f1, what happens after queen to e3, check? Well, it is better for white to move the king than block by pinning his own rook. So white should play king to h1, and then we need to look at our checks, captures, and threats. Again, queen g1 check and queen f3 check are easy to examine and then eliminate, obviously. After queen to g1 check, white could just take the queen with their king, and we don't have a good check, capture, or threat to follow up with. And likewise with queen f3 check, white could simply play queen takes f3, and again we don't, we don't have anything good as a follow up. Those are easy moves to eliminate, but it's good to look at them. As I said last week, um, sometimes the most absurd moves, the most absurd moves that fall into the category of checks, captures, or threats, actually end up being the most brilliant chess moves in the history of chess. So after queen to e3 check, white should play king h1, and we can eliminate the queen g1 and queen f3 moves. So that leaves us with one more check to examine, which is queen e4 check. After queen e4 check, white can interpose with bishop f3. And I would prefer to be the white pieces because they regain the initiative by demonstrating the superiority of their light-squared bishop over ours. Though not a terrible position for black, I am inclined to investigate the other first move check at our disposal to see if it leads to greener pastures. So, what happens if we first play queen e3 check? If white blocks with rook f2, then we have queen takes f2, and white's king is forced to h1. Then, after rook takes e2, white needs to defend against queen to g2, checkmate, so they likely would play rook 
to g1. And now we have a nice mating combination starting with rook e1, threatening queen g1 mate, to which white's likely response would be rook takes e1. And then we simply play queen takes e1, white has to play king g2, and then queen to f1, checkmate. Nice. But what if white doesn't block queen e3 check with rook f2? Well, then they can either play king to h1 or king to g2, and we must consider both responses. If king to h1, our checks are far from appealing and once again, easy to eliminate from consideration. For after queen to g1, white simply takes our queen and we don't have good recourse after that. And queen f3, um, same thing. They can take with either their bishop or their rook. And once again, we don't have good follow-ups. So we can eliminate both of those checks. But with white's king no longer able to support reloading the rook on f1, queen takes e2 might finally work. Let's take a look. After queen takes e2, we must evaluate white's checks, captures, and threats thoroughly. Quick calculations show that if white plays queen to h7, queen to f7, or queen to d5 check, black is just fine. Rook takes f8 check also needs to be examined. After rook takes f8 check, we need to play king takes f8, so our queen is not hung out to dry. For example, if you play a rook takes f8, it would be a huge mistake. White simply takes your queen. But after king takes f8, white can use another check to keep the initiative and avoid exchanging queens. So after queen f5 check, it's probably best to seek shelter on g8, because here all five of white's checks are easily dealt with. But there is a threat if white plays rook f1 that requires our attention, as it is threatening, once again, this checkmating pattern, mate in three, where white plays queen f7 check, we have to play king h8, then they can play queen to f8 check, rook takes f8, and then rook takes f8 mate. The good news is, as soon as we analyze our checks, we see an easy way to defuse the entire situation. Queen e4 check forks white's king and white's queen on f5, forcing an exchange of queens one way or another. And after king g1, queen takes f5, rook takes f5, g6, we have a nice rook and bishop versus rook endgame. So this leads to the realization that the immediate queen to e3 check, followed by either rook f2 or king h1, is winning for black. Now we only need to check one more of white's responses. If white gets out of check using king g2, then what? Well, we have a check capture with queen takes e2, which also forks the king and queen, forcing an exchange. White needs to play queen takes e2, to which we obviously respond with rook takes e2 check capture. If white blocks with rook f2, they immediately lose a rook. So white needs to step out of check, and no matter which direction they run, they can't stop us from exchanging another rook. And then once again, we would have a bishop and a rook versus a rook endgame and easily win. So, queen e3 just wins for black. And white, understandably, resigned in our feature game immediately after Vladimir Vukovic played queen to e3. I hope you enjoyed this two-part episode of Chess Think, in which we applied the checks, captures, and threats method to a key position from the 1925 game between Hermanus Karlovich Madison and Vladimir Vukovic. Had Vukovic played the very tempting 
queen takes e2, he would have lost. But because he must have examined all the checks, captures, and threats, Vukovic played queen to e3 check and immediately won. Analyzing positions with this method takes time and effort, but both time and effort are required to become an accomplished chess player anyways. Start using the checks, captures, and threats method of analysis today, and I'm sure that you will immediately play better chess. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Chess Musings YouTube channel. My name is Chris Torres, and this has been Chess Think. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons.